Watching something spin with very little friction can be quite satisfying, and this small spinning top can spin for over 5 minutes with just one spin by hand. But if we were to increase the weight of the spinning top, it should spin for a lot longer. The only problem with increasing the weight of the spinning top is it will also increase the friction at the contact point between the spinning top and the surface below. So how about we try and make a magnetically levitated flywheel? Permanent magnets have two poles, which are usually labelled north and south, and when a north pole is positioned close to a south pole, they are both attracted together. But when the magnets are arranged with matching poles near one another, the magnets are pushed apart, and it's this force that we can use to levitate the flywheel. To support the magnets, a frame can be built using these aluminium extrusions, as they're easily attached together with small brackets, almost like a Meccano kit. I can then mount the magnets to these brackets and bolt them down to the frame. For the magnets to levitate an axle, the magnets must be arranged with opposing poles like I mentioned earlier. But if you've ever tried to levitate a magnet on top of another, you'll know it's pretty much impossible to balance. That's because if the levitating magnet is offset by the smallest amount, not only do the repelling poles want to push it further to the left, but these two opposing poles are now pulling each other together, and will continue to do so until they both collide. However, if we give the shaft a small bias towards the left, we can constrain it with a smooth plate to prevent it travelling any further. This essentially turns the axle into a horizontal spinning top, where the magnets take the full weight of the flywheel, and there is very little friction created on the left, as if it were a small lightweight spinning top. Now this method of levitation was heavily inspired by this small toy that I bought off Amazon, where there's basically a shaft through the center and two sets of magnets. Then the whole shaft is constrained by this small glass plate on the side here. But if I were to remove this glass plate, like so, and then try and balance it, it just falls straight down, depending on which direction I hold it. So if I hold it slightly to the left, and if I hold it slightly to the right. So you have to have this little constraining thing, which is very little friction, but just keeps it levitating. Nice and simple. The flywheel can then be machined out of aluminium for two reasons. The first being it's easier to machine than steel on my granddad's lathe. And the second and probably most important reason is the aluminium isn't magnetic, which could cause some issues with the levitation. And even being aluminium, it still weighs about 1.4 kilograms, which should have plenty of inertia. And there we have it, a magnetically levitated flywheel. Now, you may notice it's quite wobbly, which is due to a number of reasons. I initially built this with a threaded shaft as an axle to allow for adjustable positions of the magnets and flywheel. But after buying a bunch of these, they all seem to be slightly bent. So I then bought some steel shafts, which initially seemed to be a lot straighter. But long story short, I had to heat up the flywheel to fit the shaft through the centre hole, then ended up bending the shaft by accident, and now I can't get the flywheel off of the shaft. But I've now balanced it the best I can with some taped on washers, and it will happily sit there spinning for about 12 minutes. But I have an idea that will make this setup far more interesting. What if we could somehow extract the energy from the flywheel to power something? Because of the magnetic levitation, I want to be able to extract energy from the flywheel without making physical contact with it. So we need a method of transferring energy through magnetic induction. If we hold a magnet near a wire, nothing will happen. But if we spin the magnet, the change in magnetic field will induce a small current in the wire due to Faraday's law of induction. And this is the basis on how a generator works. Unfortunately, we can't use the spinning magnets from the levitation because their poles run axially along the shaft so the magnetic field doesn't change as they spin. So I started building a rotor that will mount to the same axle as the flywheel, and will hold a bunch of magnets which were all orientated with opposing poles facing up. This meant that one magnet would have its north pole facing up, and the magnet next to it would have its south pole facing up, and so on. Then to generate electricity from this, I can wind a lot of wire into a coil, and as the magnetic field changes, a current is induced in the coil. So let's say this magnet induces a current in the upwards direction, then the magnet next to it would induce a current in the downwards direction, because of their opposite pole orientation. This completes the clockwise current direction in the coil, and the direction of current flow will alternate as the motor spins, creating alternating current, or AC. Therefore, we have created an alternator. There's just one issue. The distance between the magnets and the coil affects the efficiency of the alternator due to the magnetic field being weaker as the distance between the two is increased. 
This isn't a huge issue in conventional alternators as they can run the magnets really close to the coils due to tight tolerance bearings. However, this magnetically levitated axle isn't exactly precise and could run the risk of the magnets colliding with the coils. So to overcome this efficiency loss due to the large safety gap between the magnets and the coil, we can add a second rotor of magnets on the other side of the coil. This extends the magnetic field to look something like this and greatly increases the strength of the magnetic field in the coils, allowing for plenty of space for the shaft to wobble about. I then started winding wire around a 3D printed template to create the coil of the alternator, but we also need something to turn the alternating current into direct current if we want to power something like a light bulb or an electric motor. To convert the AC to DC, we need to use some diodes which are essentially one-way valves for electricity. Current can flow through this direction no problem, but isn't able to flow back through the other way. And if we arrange four diodes in a formation like this, we've built what's known as a full bridge rectifier. The way this works is all the diodes are orientated in a way that the current can only flow in the downwards direction. So if we connect the alternator coil to these points on the rectifier and apply a current in the clockwise direction, the current has no choice but to flow down through this diode. And in reverse, it has no other choice but to flow down through this diode. This means if we connect a DC component like an LED to the top and bottom of the rectifier, as the coil creates a clockwise current, it will flow from the coil down through this diode over towards the LED, and then after the LED, it will flow towards the top of the rectifier and down through this diode, which connects it back to the coil completing the circuit. But if the coil creates an anti-clockwise current direction, it will flow through this wire to the rectifier, which directs it downwards through this diode along towards the LED back up towards the top of the rectifier and finally down through this diode to complete the circuits again. So no matter the current direction at the coil, the current direction at the LED is always in the same direction. Okay, so I've got one of the coils hooked up to the full bridge rectifier and also a capacitor just to smooth out the voltage and also a multimeter to see if we can get some voltage out of this thing. So, I mount the flywheel. We're getting some voltage. I think it's just charging up the capacitor at the moment. It's quite a large capacitor. It's gonna go in faster. <laughs> 0 0.7 of a volt. <laughs> Creating electricity from a magnetically levitated flywheel. <laughs> 0 0.7 of a volt isn't going to power anything interesting. So I wound four more coils and connected them in series which should multiply the voltage by four. Then with some assistance from an electric drill, it can generate quite a few more volts. But I don't really see much fun in requiring a drill to spin this thing up. It would be much cooler to have it as a desk toy that I can spin by hand and have it power something at much lower RPM. So to increase the voltage, I rewound all the coils with much thinner wire so I could double the number of coils. Then I soldered together a new full bridge rectifier with slightly smaller diodes and larger capacitors. And now I can get nearly 10 volts when spinning it by hand. So now that the alternator can produce much higher voltage, I think we should try and power some stuff. So I've got a whole bunch of LEDs here, and if we can get these to glow, then maybe we can move on to something with a bit more power, such as these electric motors. So let's hook up the full bridge rectifier with these crocodile clips, then we can connect them to the breadboard. And then I'm going to try these red LEDs because according to this, they're the lowest power consumption. So they should be the easiest to glow. Plug it in like that, and then give it a spin. Can you see that on the camera? It's probably quite dim. That glows at really low RPM on the flywheel. Let's try plugging in some more. There's two LEDs, three LEDs, four. They're probably too dim for the camera now, so I'll spin it up to speed a bit more. Five LEDs, eight LEDs. Right, let's try 10 LEDs. Easily powering 10 LEDs. I think I need to close the curtains in this room to see them glowing properly on the camera. <laughs> 10 LEDs glowing from a magnetically levitated flywheel. <laughs>
Right, so I think what we need to do is uh, red lights aren't exactly useful for lighting up a room. So let's try some white LEDs. These require a bit more, oh wow, that works straight away. I thought these would require faster RPM because they require higher voltage. Increase the RPM. Wow, these are really bright. Let's see how many of these we can do. That's four, six, eight, then finally 10. Right, they're looking quite dim at the moment, so let's spin it up. Powers them with ease. Well, I probably need to balance it if I want to get any higher voltage. Let's go further. So this is 11, 13, 15. The fly was slowing down, so let's speed it up again. And they all come to life. <laughs> That's so satisfying. And 20 LEDs. Right, let's spin it up again. This is creating quite a decent amount of power. I did not expect that to light so many LEDs. So it might actually have a chance of moving some of these electric motors. One interesting thing before we move on to the motors, you may be able to see in the camera, they're flickering slightly. And uh, that's because as the alternator spins around, um, it only creates a pulse of electricity as it passes the coil. And they should pulse perfectly in time with the magnets lining up with the coils. Right, so let's unplug these LEDs and then we'll see if we can power an electric motor. <laughs> How do I position this camera so you can still see the motor and all the wires so I'm not faking it. <laughs> I could be faking all of this. It's spinning. There's something oddly satisfying about a spinning object spinning a motor. I'm just gonna take my microphone off so you can hear the motor a bit better. Okay, I reckon it's going to struggle with the slightly larger motor. Let's get this going fast. Double-handed spin. I'm going to rest the setup on top of these mats because I don't think I've made the frame quite square so it wobbles. There we go, much better. Nothing. I think the only way to get this one to spin is to possibly charge up the capacitors uh, beforehand and then plug it in. So if we get it spinning, charge up the capacitors. There we go. <laughs> it's like an electronic gearbox, sort of. You have to check this out. I have the original flywheel alternator set up. And if I move backwards a tiny bit, we have an augmented reality generated version of it. This is done without the need for an Android or iOS app but instead using a website called Thangs, who are the sponsor of this video. Thangs is the fastest growing 3D community with over 3 million available models for you to search, store, and collaborate on. Let's say you need to join two of these aluminum extrusions together. Just a quick search will find you many models to choose from. Then you can download the one you want and print it out. Because why waste time designing your own bracket when someone else has already designed one for you? Or if you have started designing a part and have run out of time to finish it, you can use their geometric search to find models that are similar to yours. You can also use Thangs to create private projects with your friends to share great ideas and collaborate. Being able to view projects in augmented reality without having to download and import them into your CAD software makes it so much easier to know what you're looking at. So go check out Thangs by clicking my link in the description below and start exploring today. Big thanks to Thangs for sponsoring this video. And if you enjoyed this video, it'd be great if you could leave a thumbs up down below. If you're new to my channel and want to see other projects similar to this, then please click subscribe down below. And a massive thank you to all of my supporters over on patreon.com for making these projects possible. I honestly couldn't do these projects without your support. So thanks once again. Thanks once again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.